Hello there. Welcome to my show. COVID-19 update by Hirak. Today is June 11, 2020, Thursday, and it is summertime. It's hot outside in Virginia. It was uh, in the high 80s today. Uh, it was hot, you know, and um, it's summer. There's still COVID-19. Dr. Fauci, WHO, they were all wrong, right? They were saying it's seasonal, it's like flu, it's not a flu. Here are Christian Kim, that's who I am. Um, said from the very beginning that this is 365 days a year virus. I was right. World Health Organization, WHO was wrong. Center for Disease Control, CDC, was wrong. But here I, Christian Kim, was right. So all of you who have been watching this show, you have had the benefit of the wisdom and knowledge of here I, Christian Kim. As you know, I'm uh, running for uh, U.S. Congress. I'm an independent candidate for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th district, which is Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and parts of Fairfax County. And you are uh, hearing uh, Bollywood music from India. Uh, the reason I'm playing you uh, Bollywood music is that COVID-19 death just started spiking in India. And I'm worried, you know, I, I love India. I go to India and teach. I'm an adjunct professor uh, at a Christian university in India. I'm worried because uh, COVID-19 deaths started spiking in India. I'm worried that millions of people will die in India. And that's a big worry, you know, because uh, healthcare is, is not very good in most of India. So one of the things that I want to do is uh, I want to set up a hospital and nursing school in India. So um, I want to get some experience in America, obviously, and then start a nursing school where, you know, I'm an adjunct professor, train nurses to help the uh, healthcare system in India. But you know, it's worrisome because, um, you know, a lot of towns and villages do not have any uh, medical facility. Uh, so there's a possibility millions, maybe tens of millions of people can die in India. So I'm kind of concerned about that. Because there's no va vaccine, there's no cure, and this is a 365 days a year virus, COVID-19. I'm very concerned. So I'm playing some Bollywood music for you so you can uh, kind of understand what's going on in India, kind of listen to the music that they listen to. You know, some of, more, many of them, Bollywood music. I don't know if you've seen a Bollywood movie, but they're definitely worth it. Uh, there's a movie called Devdas, uh, which is uh, you know a good movie. Um, Sharka Khan, uh, he's Indian Muslim. Uh, he's uh, one of the most famous stars in, in uh, Indian cinema in Bollywood. And he's one of my favorite stars. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, check out some Bollywood movies. I think um, Netflix has some Bollywood movies and they have great singing, they have great dancing, and usually they have like, uh, you know, uh, theme of love, romantic love, yeah, and um, yeah, so enjoy that. Today is National Nursing Assistance Day, um, and it's actually the whole week is uh, Nursing Assistance Week. As you know, uh, 
I worked as a certified nursing assistant in uh, Delaware, uh, in the state of Delaware facility, uh, long-term care. Hopefully not too many of them are dying, but uh, you know, I took care of um, uh, people who are you know, rehabilitating or some had palliative care. Palliative care are people you know, who, uh, who need comfort. And some of them had hospice care, like, you know, they, uh, they were, you know, just kind of headed toward death. And so I worked as a certified nursing assistant there. And I've worked as a certified nursing assistant uh, in Virginia as well, in Richmond area. And so uh, I had my uh, certified nurse's aid uh, certificate that I got uh, in Delaware, Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and so this week is meaningful for me because, you know, I work to help people. Uh, and it's difficult work, you know, being a, a nurse's aide, you know, certified nurse's aide. Uh, it's very hard work, especially if you're working at a rehabilitation center. My daily schedule, generally I had a 12-hour shift from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, and daily schedule, basically, every two hours you're, you're going around um, patients in a whole section, generally like 20 or 30 patients, and you're basically uh, uh, changing their diapers and wiping them and cleaning them. It's like every two hours, for 12 hours, so like six times throughout the night, you're like cleaning them. And uh, you know, sometimes you have a you know, bathing schedule, so you, you bathe the people who are rehabilitating and some of them have shower routine, some of them have a bath, tub routine. Some of the patients are like 350, 400 pounds, so you have to use a Hoya lift, which is an equipment to lift heavy patients. You have to carry them to a, a bath, and a special bath, and then uh, so you're gonna follow the schedule and you know, uh, some CNA, certified nurses aid, uh, injured their you know arm or uh, fingers, have carpal tunnel syndrome because they do a lot of manual work. Other skeletal muscular, musculoskeletal, uh, you know, weakness or uh, injury. Uh, and uh, generally, we feed the patients. Like generally, it's dinner. Uh, when you start working, you know, uh, late. Um, you know, uh, snacks. Yeah, and uh, Insure, it's like a protein shake that's very popular snack. Yeah, so, you know, I work with patients who are, you know, dying or, you know, on the way to death, kind of uh, meeting their needs, you know. Um, so I got to learn a lot about the life of, uh, you know, certified nurses aid, and how they take care of uh, elderly population. And as you know, COVID-19 is killing a lot of the elderly population. Uh, and so uh, I know the population who are dying. So I, you know, met their needs, worked with them. And so, you know, I celebrate uh, with you, all the certified nurses aid, who are, you know, frontline workers right now. I mean, you're seeing a lot of deaths right now because a lot of elderly people are dying from COVID. Uh, it's highly unfortunate, but that's what's happening. As you know, I'm running for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th District. Uh, so, you know, I hope you'll vote for me on November 3rd, 2020. I filed a lawsuit against Virginia Governor Northam and Virginia Board of Elections because, um, as you know, uh, Virginia Governor Northam issued a stay-at-home order on March 30th. And he said it will last until uh, June um, 10th. Uh, so I had to submit 1,000 signature voters by June 9th. But because of this uh, executive order, stay at home order, from March 30th to June uh, 10th, I, I could not collect the signatures. So I asked the Virginia Board of Elections for a waiver. And the commissioner, who's the head of the uh, Virginia Board of Elections, wrote back and said, he doesn't have a legal authority to do that, but I know Governor Northam does. So I wrote him, but he hasn't responded. So I was left with no choice but to file a lawsuit in Arlington Circuit Court uh, 
on June 3rd. You're still several days before uh, the deadline. You just gotta file the lawsuit in time, right? So that's what I did. Uh, and so um, uh, Virginia Sheriff's Office will serve uh, uh, Governor Nordum and, um, you know, uh, and also, um, uh, you know, Virginia Board of Elections because I'm the plaintiff and Governor Nordum is uh, the defendant. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting summer uh, because, um, you know, as you know, everything that happens in the court is public record. There's no secret. So any of you in America or even in United Kingdom or South Korea, uh, China, Germany, Russia, you know, wherever you are, you can follow this case. Uh, that's one great thing about America is we have uh, transparency of court cases. So anything that happens in the court is public record. It's not sealed. It's available to the public. Uh, and so, so if you go to, uh, if you Google uh, Arlington Circuit Court uh, on Google, you will come up to their address and then you can enter their electronic system that has cases of court cases and just click there's a criminal and civil this is civil you uh tick the civil part box and you type in my name kim my last name comma hirak which is my first name my middle name is christian so kim comma hirak christian and then you search my name will come up with my case number you click on that you could follow along uh, the development of the court case so it can be some something that's fun for you to do especially if you're uh staying at home or you know self-isolating at home right it gives you a, a different dimension to kind of uh use your day and and have a hobby so i encourage you to do that you know i filed a lawsuit against governor northam uh because uh you know he's playing dirty politics as you know i'm an official candidate in u.s uh, for u.s congress in virginia's eighth district that's arlington alexandria Falls Church of Fairfax County. Um, and uh, I'm registered with Federal Election Commission, which is the federal body. I mean, President Trump is monitored through that. Everybody, senators, House of Representatives, the federal officials and candidates who run for federal positions are officially registered. So you can even go to that website, Federal Election Commission and Google my name. Uh, and then you can follow along with that as well. Because I'm officially registered, you know, I'm legit, I'm official. Uh, and also I'm registered with United States Congress, Office of the Clerk. So you could Google that as well, United States Congress, Office of the Clerk, you can type my name, uh, and they, their records are public information as well. So you can see that in United States, you could, you could Google it and see it in England, it's public record for the world, right? So. Because in the United States, we want everything to be uh, transparent. And so um, because Virginia Governor Northern played dirty politics and Don Byer is the Democrat, just like Virginia Governor Northern, not like buddies, you know, they're using the Old, uh, Old Boys Network to try to block me out of uh, Virginia's ballot box. Because each state, there are 50 states, each state has their own board of elections. So Virginia has Virginia Board of Elections. District of Columbia, District of Columbia Board of Elections, Maryland has Maryland Board of Elections, and they're all guided by their own state law. You know, uh, and so in Virginia, you know, uh, there's this state law that says you gotta collect thousand signatures. And obviously it's not hard to do, but there was COVID-19 and Virginia Governor Northam shut the whole state down from March 30th to June 10th with a stay at home order, meaning even though they had some phased opening, everybody was supposed to stay at home. So that's the legal thing. So you can't go around door to door knocking and stuff. That's like illegal. Uh, and so I couldn't collect any signatures. So obviously that's unfair, right? Because it's impossible for me to collect signatures. So that's why I asked for a waiver. And obviously it's a fair thing to do for Virginia Governor Northam to give me a, uh, a waiver, but he, uh, he hasn't written me back yet. 
I wrote them and emailed them. And so I, I, I took it to court. So I'm suing him in court. Uh, and this is going to be all public knowledge for the rest of Virginia Governor Northam's life. He will have a record that he was sued by Hirak Christian Kim. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I, because this is permanent record, you know. Court, court lawsuits are permanent. You, can, you, you, could, you could Google this like 20 years from now. You know, this will be there. I mean, this is public record. It's a formal record. This is what history is made with, formal records. As you know, I'm a historian, so you know, I, I, I study history from 2,000 years ago, but that's what we do. We study court cases and, you know, public records, you know, uh, and, and we construct the history. So when people look at history of Virginia, when they write about Governor Northam, they will have to include this because as a good historian, you're gonna include all the sources, right? If you leave anything out, you're not a good historian, you're not a good journalist. Uh, and so um, this is part of permanent history of Virginia. This is part of permanent history of 2020 election year. Yes, because it's not a public record. Yeah, it's filed. It's officially filed. You can't undo it. It's filed. So um, now the sheriff, uh, you know, Virginia sheriff will be serving uh, uh, Virginia Governor Northam uh, because that's his duty to do. So yeah, I'm looking forward to going Amano, Amano with Governor Northam. Yeah, I'm confident I could beat him. He looks a little wimpy. <laughs> yeah, I could take him on. Governor Northam, are you ready for the He-Man? Hirak, Hirakio, He-Man. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty excited about the fight. You know, who doesn't like a fight, right? Fight, 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 fight. Fight, 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 fight. I'm sure there are cheerleaders cheering for me to win, to, to knock out Virginia Governor Northam in this legal battle in Virginia's circuit court, Arlington Circuit Court. I am sure I have cheerleaders in Virginia's 8th District, Arlington, Alexandria Falls Church, Fairfax County, who are cheering for me right now as we speak. They want a KO, a knockout. Yeah, I'm gonna knock Virginia Governor Northam out in the court of law. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm so excited about this. No, I mean, I, if I if I look too, glee, too gleeful, you know, you gotta excuse me because I'm. This is the best thing that happened. I was kind of hoping. I have to, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you because I'm always honest. I was secretly hoping that Virginia Governor Northam would not give me a waiver so I could take him to court. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's just, it's more fun battling it out in the courts, you know, because number one, you're battling on official record. Everything you say in the court becomes official record. I mean, every single thing. I mean, there's a transcriber who's transcribing. And if you say, Achoo, they, I think they have to transcribe that too. I mean, everything you say in the court of law becomes official record, permanent official record. And they have a transcript, and sometimes they video record you, sometimes they uh, audio record you. So you have a permanent record uh, for history. I mean, this is permanent. It cannot be undone. It's permanent record. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm an honest man, and I like transparency. So I'm like, yeah, let's do this, Governor Northam. Let's go to court. And it's just like, you say what you want to say. I say what I want to say. And let's see what happens, you know. And all of this gets recorded on permanent record. Uh, and obviously, because it's public record and permanent record, you can always request it. I mean, from what I understand, anybody can request it. Um, this is like public record. Everything that happens in the court is public record. You know, so I just, I just love it, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, bring it on, bring it on, you know. I, the greatest thing for a historian is discovering official records because that's how you construct the history, right? You know, you have uh, official record and historians, there could be thousands of historians writing on the same event using the same records to construct history. Uh, and so for me, I was like, 
you know, Virginia Governor Northern just gave me a waiver that I, I just, my name just goes on the Virginia ballot. From now to November, I do all these, you know, campaigning stuff and I, I may win, but you, you, don't, you don't see the conflict between Hirak, Christian Kim, and Virginia Governor Northern, who's a Democrat. I'm independent, but I'm conservative. Now that I filed a, 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 a lawsuit against Virginia Governor Northern officially in the court of law, it's official. I mean, it's like, it's not just like campaigning. We're talking about a whole different dimension, right? And I would be campaigning against Virginia Governor Northern anyway, right? Because I'm running for US Congress in Virginia's 8th District. I'm running against Don Byer. So the focus would have been just Don Byer and me, basically. But now that I've uh, filed a lawsuit against Virginia Governor Northern, you know, I can battle with Governor Northern as well. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, how, you know, I'm a Calvinist, I'm Presbyterian. And you know, Calvinists throughout history, you know, we just love wars. Love wars make us feel alive. You know, Oliver Cromwell is a Calvinist and you know, and all these Puritans wrote books after books on decapitating Charles I, King Charles I, and why it is a legitimate thing to do. I mean, geez, you know, these Puritans, they beat it to death, you know, before they do it, you know? It's like they perfected the art form of beating something to death before doing something. But the important thing is Puritans like to fight, you know? Uh, and that's why, you know, uh, these Calvinists, uh, they, uh, Oliver Cromwell was a Calvinist, so you have these things, you know, where Calvinists are battling it out. And John Calvin created uh, his own kingdom in Geneva, like city of Geneva. He, he created his own kingdom by killing a lot of people in wars. Calvinists love wars, you know? So unlike other reformers like Luther and others, you know, who let politicians kill, John Calvin was, was actively involved in the warfare because he loved wars. So I'm <laughs> like, I mean, I'm in that tradition, you know, like there are different, you know, like Christian traditions, right? You have the uh, Mennonites who are peaceful. They don't like war. You know, they're conscious, conscientious objectors to wars. They don't like to kill anybody. You have Lutherans who, you know, they, they don't mind wars, but they try to separate like religion and, you know, soldiers. And then you have the Calvinists like me or Stonewall Jackson, who's Presbyterian, who combines religion and war. You know, Stonewall Jackson said, when I fight in a war and kill enemy soldiers, that is glorifying God. <laughs> I just love that man, Stonewall Jackson. You know, I shared with you his statue in Richmond, Virginia. There's a statue of Stonewall Jackson in Richmond, Virginia on a horse. And uh, he was trained at West Point. And it was devout Christian. You know, uh, so was Robert E. Lee. You know, I respect these two uh, Christian men greatly. That's why I, I like their statue. I don't want their statues removed. So they're good Christian, Christian men who love Jesus Christ. Uh, and they're also part of history. So, you know, we need to preserve history. I'm a historian. I value historical artifacts. So I don't think we should remove them. Uh, but, um, yeah. So Calvinism is one one brand of Christianity, we could say, we call it denomination in Christianity. For those of you who are watching me from India, who may be Hindus or Muslims, uh, you know, I have a global audience here, you know, everybody's watching this show. So, you know, there are people who may not be Christians, so I have to explain, you know, even basic things that other Christians may understand. Uh, so we have these things called denomination, which is like a grouping. Uh, and I belong to Presbyterian denomination, uh, and the Presbyterians believe in Calvinist theology. Uh, and John Calvin, a Frenchman, uh, was the founder of this theological movement. Presbyterians are part of it. French Huguenots, uh, they're French Calvinists. We call them Huguenots. They're part of this movement. Dutch Reformed Church, Dutch Calvinists, they're part of this movement. Whole, you know, whole country of Holland. Uh, it's like reform Dutch, the German reform are part of this movement. Presbyterians are part of this movement. And they're uniting church, united church, which are kind of part of this movement. And one of the defining characteristics of original Calvinism is that we combine theology and uh, politics and warfare. And so uh, John Calvin created a theodicy, a theocracy. Theocracy is a rule by God. 
a theocracy. So John Calvin created a theocracy in Geneva, which means the whole country is supposedly being ruled by God. And then John Calvin is like, kind of like the Ayatollah Khomeini. You know, he's like the religious guy, the spiritual advisor who kind of guides everything. And then uh, basically he guides who becomes the president or, you know, king or ruler or whatever. Or sometimes he rules himself, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, so it's kind of like Iran, but it's a, I mean, Iran is after John Calvin's Geneva, which was like 500 years ago. So you gotta say Iran is more like Geneva, you know, the, it's a theocracy. So think of uh, John Calvin as the Ayatollah Khomeini, of, since you probably understand Iran well. So Calvinism believes that this is the best form of government, that the whole government is government by God, uh, and um, and the rule is that the whole whole country should respect God and follow God's law. Not just follow God's law, but the whole country should be ruled by God as king. And then you have the earthly rulers, uh, whether they be a pastor like John Calvin, or like a political leader uh, like President Trump who rules there. So I would say the closest approximation is Iran, like Ayatollah Khomeini uh, being the spiritual advisor, but he's like the dead true ruler. And then you have these presidents who kind of rule, but they're kind of like, you know, under the guide, quote, guidance of Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, and so Geneva was like that. So John Calvin was like Ayatollah Khomeini, and then you had these rulers. So. Calvinism, Presbyterianism, you know, we believe that this is the most perfect form of government. Uh, and so um, uh, that's the historical, that's, you know, we've been thinking like that for 500 years. Uh, obviously, you know, we haven't been able to realize that everywhere, but in Geneva it was realized, but that's the ideal uh, form of government. And some say like the Puritans, pilgrims, when they arrived um, with Mayflower, they created a theocracy in Massachusetts, uh, Plymouth Plantation, where basically the authority was with God. It was a type of theocracy. Uh, and so they called it a city on a hill. So America has a blended history, meaning you have these Calvinists in Massachusetts area who created a theocracy in Massachusetts. In Virginia, people were a little bit more into like a, a qualified monarchy, right? Uh, because, um, you know, you had the, um, the, you know, the rights movement, like Magna Carta movement that was developing and um, different thinkers who were emphasizing, you know, rights of humans. And then in America, this Calvinist theocracy movement met democratizing movement. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's how this nation was formed. So even now you have a very religious dimension to, to America. Uh, and that goes back all the way to uh, Pilgrims and Plymouth uh, Plantation. And so, um, you know, if you haven't had a chance to visit Plymouth uh, Rock, I would encourage you to visit there and visit the village and uh, discover some history. But right now, because of COVID-19, really, you can't really do anything. And I would encourage you to go on vacations with your children this summer. COVID-19 is killing 1,000 Americans per day. So the more you travel, the more you're outside, there's a higher chance you're going to get COVID and die. So, yeah, but so I'm running for Virginia's uh, eighth district, and uh, I'm excited, you know, I fight is good, you know, we're not pacifist. I'm sorry, but Calvinists have never been pacifists in the history of um, Protestant Reformation. We're the violent ones. <laughs> we embrace war. We love war. So for 500 years, when we talk about uh, Protestants who love peace, they're the Amish people, Mennonites, you know, they're like friendly, fuzzy, they don't like wars, they don't like killing people. Now the Calvinists, we're like, 
Northern Ireland, Belfast, you know? <laughs> we love war. I mean, we tried to pick fights just so that we could have a war. Uh, obviously, there's rules of engagement in Calvinism. You can't just start a war for no reason. And this goes back to the concept of just war by St. Augustine, uh, whose ideals were kind of carried through uh, through the Middle Ages by various Catholic thinkers. And then um, John Calvin and also Martin Luther were Augustinian monks. So they kind of transmitted the kind of Augustinian theology that was transmitted through Catholic thinkers, and they kind of channeled that into Protestant Reformation. But Calvin was more aggressive about embracing just war theory. Uh, and so, yeah, so if you look at Northern Ireland, Belfast, you kind of understand a little bit what Calvinists are like. They, Calvinists love war. Uh, if a war is just, they, they have no problem killing in warfare. So let's say, you know, uh, United States went to war with China. Uh, like a typical Calvinist, their goal will be to kill a like, million Chinese soldiers. That will be their goal. I mean, they will see that as their righteous cause. Not only righteous cause, a calling from God. So a typical Calvinist soldier would say, would testify to you in a church, God called me to West Point to be a soldier so that I could kill as many people as I can in warfare that is just. That would be their testimony. I, I kill for God's glory because everyone I kill in the enemy's camp is a kill for God's glory. That's what a typical Calvinist would say. Uh, and Calvinism for 500 years said, killing, soldiers killing is never sin. It's never sin. So you can kill as many people as you want. You don't have to ask God for forgiveness because it's not sin. And you know, it's, it's accurate. I would say if you read the Bible, you don't have Joshua praying after killing all those Canaanites. You know, it wasn't a sin. So soldiers killing enemy soldiers in warfare is never sin in Calvinism. And that goes back to Joshua's warfare. And also, it's consistent with Romans chapter 13 of 2,000 years of Christian theology, basically, Augustinian version. Uh, so uh, what that translates into is we love to fight, but it has to be a just war, meaning like Governor Northam was unjust and he issued a stay in order, but he didn't give me a waiver. That's injustice. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. So Governor Norton is not going to have just, uh, no peace. Because there's no justice, no peace. Yeah, that's just the whole, we care about justice. So, so Governor Norton is probably not going to get any sleep from now until, you know, however long. Because <laughs> I love war, you know. I mean, a just war. I love just war. Come on, let's, let's be honest here. I don't love all wars. I just love just war. And, you know, like just war is when people do you wrong for no reason at all then you have the right to wage in just war. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing it in the court of law because, you know, I mean, that's I mean, I'm following standard protocol. So, so I was like, I hope Governor, I was going to wait until like June 6th or 7th, you know, because I had to submit a thousand signatures by June 9th, right? But I'm like, it's June 3rd. Oh, man, I'm like itching to file this lawsuit. So I just went and filed it. <laughs> yeah. No, because I love war. You know, I was like looking forward to this this war with uh with the governor of Northern. I'm like, thank God he gave me this war by being unjust towards me. Ah, you know, just war theory. <laughs> so I'm like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this war. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this battle of righteousness in the court of law in Arlington Circle. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Thank you, Jesus. This is your gift to me. This war against Governor Northam and Arlington Circuit Court. Thank you, Jesus, for your gift. I'm, I, 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 I cannot describe to you how happy I am that he, he decided to be unjust towards me because no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Oh, my gosh. I'm so happy that he, he was unjust because that way I could respond. So, you know, I could battle, governor of the northern, in the court of law, and circuit court, 
make his life miserable. <laughs> you know, oh my gosh, just war. You know, we're justified in doing anything we want. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll talk more about justify, uh, justified uh, warfare. Uh, but yeah, so I'm gonna be like just making his life miserable through uh, Virginia's court system every way I can, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't wait, uh, this is so exciting. But anyway, uh, you know, there are a lot of Presbyterians in Virginia, you know? Um, uh, Union Theological Seminary in Richmond was a very strong, uh, you know, right now it's like liberal, but it used to be a very good Presbyterian seminary. Uh, and so, you know, Presbyterianism is fairly strong in Virginia. Uh, so, you know, those of you who are Presbyterian, uh, you know, origin, you understand what I mean, you know? And that's why you have uh, Stonewall Jackson who, who's Presbyterian, because, you know, we, we believe that there's no limit to war. Like, you know, um, you know, as long as it's a just war, everything is possible, everything is okay. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of excited at this, you know, this uh, court, court battle between me and Governor Northam. I, <laughs> I, I get to run a campaign against Tom Byer and I get to wage war against Governor Northam in the court of law. And you know, his, it's his election year next year. So geez, I mean, you know, maybe I could drag this on until like 2021, November. <laughs> oh, that'd be so great. Yeah, so I'm excited. Um, I, I hope you will keep following along with this exciting conflict. Now it used to be just like, Kira versus Dawn, you know, on November 3rd. Now it's like Kira versus Dawn on November 3rd. And Kira versus Ralph. Governor of Virginia in the court of law, Arlington Circuit Court. <laughs> you know, I have two battles now. Yes, I mean, you know, uh, um, you know, maybe I could start some kind of a battle with uh, Senator uh, Mark Mark uh, Warner. You know, oh my gosh, I mean, you know, maybe I could drag him into this somehow. You know, I mean, that would be that would be so fun. You know, dragging in like more and more Democrats into this war. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I mean, like. Possibilities are endless. Oh my gosh, who am I gonna get throw the ball to? I threw the ball to go to uh, Virginia Governor Northam. Now you're gonna get served by uh, Virginia Sheriff and we're gonna duke it out in the court of law. Isn't that exciting? Yay! Yeah, so um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited about uh, 2020. Uh, it's turning out to be a great year for me personally because of all these battles that I, I that that have been gifted to me by God to fight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, because you know, Calvinists we thrive on just war, right? You know, we we love just war. I mean, just look as the people as the Presbyterians in Northern North, Northern Ireland you know, for 500 years they've been like waging that war. I mean, you know, it just we love it. I mean, just. It, it makes us feel alive. It makes us feel closer to God. It, it just war makes, yeah, makes Calvinists feel like they're closer to God. You know, because, yeah, I mean, just, I'll talk more about just war some other day, because today, you know, we have other things to talk about, so I can't talk too much about it, but yeah, please keep, just, please treat me unjustly, so, so I can wage just war, please. No justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. Oh my gosh, I love this stuff. You know, you should read some of the things that Calvinists wrote during Revolutionary War and Civil War. Oh, they loved it. I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, it's a, <laughs> and there's nothing better than like a just war. Because, you know, number one, if you have like a Civil War or a Revolutionary War, you have the license to kill, approved by God if it's a just war. So like every Presbyterian who killed the uh, Irish Catholics in Northern Ireland, they didn't commit a sin. That's not a sin because it's a war. It's technically a war between Presbyterians and Catholics in Belfast. It's, it's a war, religious war between Catholics and Presbyterians. So, so any Presbyterian who kills in this war context is not sinning. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't have to ask God for forgiveness. You don't have to, you know, I mean, you go to church and say, yeah, I killed five Catholics. They'll be like, yes, praise the Lord, you know, because, you know, for Calvinists in warfare, if you're in war, then you wage war, right? That's what you do, you kill people in war. So we are very proud of the Presbyterians who killed Irish Catholics in Northern Ireland. I mean, obviously I'm Presbyterian, 
like one of my heroes in Northern Ireland is Reverend Ian Paisley, who, who, uh, who attacked the uh, IRA, Irish Republican Army, which is designated in America as a terrorist organization. Um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, so like Reverend Ian Paisley would, was thinking like he's just attacking the terrorists, you know, that's what he's thinking, kind of attacking Intifada. I'm sure that a lot of Presbyterians in America were like itching and dying to declare Antifada a terrorist organization so they could go and start attacking them. <laughs> you know, a lot of fun things are happening in America now. You know, America, you know, not everyone is Presbyterian, but a lot of Baptists have been influenced by Calvinists, uh, not only Baptists, but Methodists, Lutherans, Catholics. I mean, Catholic came from Catholicism, right? Augustinian concept of just war. So, People like war, you know, in America, you know, uh, you know, just think of like our country, like whenever we go to war, people like it, you know, people love to go to war. So that's part of like the Augustinian Calvinist tradition, you know, the Catholics obviously have the Augustinian influence directly and the Protestants in America, they have a filtered, you know, more violent version of Augustinianism through Calvin. Uh, so, <laughs> Antifa, Antifa, maybe they'll give us a reason for just war. We're kind of excited, all of us, right? Are you excited? Are you excited? Protestants out there, are you just like, no justice, no peace, Antifa, no justice, no peace, Antifa. I know you guys are itching out there. Yeah, I, I, I know what, yeah, what you, you know, what, how you feel. But anyway, you know, it's a 500 years of experience that we've shared, you know, as Calvinists as um, Protestants, so uh, we know how that is. I mean, we waged war for 500 years for religion, for our religion. So, uh, yeah, so it's a sacred tradition for us, 500 year tradition, but anyway, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm excited. I, I'm very happy about what's going on right now in America. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, if you have been following my tweets from today, I've been tweeting uh, President Trump to purify the, the uh, US military, because I think we have too many homosexuals and pro-transgender people there who are criticizing the president. So I'm like, well, yeah, let's, let's purge the military, you know, let's, let's get, get the military on the right ground. Like, we, this country is really messed up right now. You have a defund police movement and all these US generals who are like prob probably hom closet homosexuals, you know, like complaining and, you know, you know to the media, you know, and it's just like, Geez, is this what we need? Like just the military people like being insubordinate and you know, like mounting an insurrection against the, you know, chain of command for no reason. I mean, just President Trump has a legitimate concern here, safety of Americans. And President Trump has the right to use the Insurrection Act to suppress the insurrection. That's his right. He has to protect the citizens. And the US military, they have to follow the chain of command. Like and in times of war, you could actually shoot the soldiers. Who, um, who derelict, you know that, right? You could shoot them, like, let's say we are in a war in Afghanistan against Muslim terrorists. And let's say a US Marine just kind of like uh, leaves the battlefield, you could shoot them. Yeah, because you have no time to like have a court case, you know? So if a soldier like abandons his duty in war during wartime, the standard policy is shoot them, you kill them right there on the battlefield because you don't, you don't want him to run away, right? You don't want him to go to the enemy side and start giving secrets, right? If he's running away from his unit. So yeah, you just shoot to kill. You know, obviously it's not sin. Because during war, there are certain engagement. Like God is a reasonable being. God is reasonable. In time of peace, you use the court system. But in time of war, Rules are a little bit different. And, you know, I can't go into all the details now. Uh, but, you know, I, I'll talk about it a little bit more in the future. But among the soldiers, in times of emergency, if there's dereliction of duty, um, you could shoot to kill. Yeah, it's not sin. I mean, actually, you're supposed to do that according to Christian uh, system of warfare, just warfare. So, um, yeah, but anyway, there's, there are a lot of rules and regulations about warfare. You know, every detail has been discussed. Think about it. Christian church has been around for like 2,000 years. You know, they've been writing about this for like 2,000 years. They have nothing better to do. You know, these theologians, they sit and just write about every nitpicking detail. Yeah, so everything's been written about. 
So it's nothing new if you know the materials and you've read the materials. But um, yeah, so, so yeah, so I'm like, let's purge the military. Let's just take the stripes away from these generals, you know? Let's put people in there who's gonna like bring order and, and law and order in our country, not like, you know, side with defund police, you know, for God's sake, I mean, they're like traitors. I mean, I actually think, you know, I'm a Calvinist. I know President Trump is Calvinist, he's Presbyterian. Went to like Presbyterian church and he grew up as a Presbyterian, so he kind of knows what I mean. Um, I actually think we have the right to try generals who are siding with defund police as traitors. Like we could court martial them using military police, not only take their stripes away, but like treat them as criminals. Yeah. Because they're they're compromising national security. So I think President Trump is being too nice. My personal opinion is he, President Trump has to get tougher with the generals because they're creating a chaotic situation that they should not. And all these retired generals talking on TV, that's ridiculous. Someone should pass a law saying all the generals who retired should shut up. It's like, the problem is this, we're not in time of peace. With COVID-19, which is killing 1,000 Americans per day, it's a national emergency. So we're not in time of peace. So you, you cannot have all these retired generals going and bad-mouthing the commander-in-chief. We just can't have it. So we need to pass a law. And this is why I need to be in US Congress, uh, because these generals represent something. Even if they're retired, they represent uh, the military. So during times of peace, you can criticize the president when you want, but we're not in time of peace, technically because we are in a national emergency, COVID-19. So somebody has to put a muzzle on all these generals, like forbid them from, like what I would do if I were in US Congress and I would encourage all the congressmen to do this is bind them in US Secrecy Act and also bind them by a special legislation not to talk in public because they're creating a chaotic situation that destabilizes America and is making America insecure. Our national security is at stake. So we need to muzzle all the US military personnel. They can't speak in public. I mean, they could testify in a court of law, like a Senate hearing, congressional hearing, you know, like a court case, like, you know, me suing <laughs> vampire in the court of law, like, yeah, in the court of law, come and speak, you know, public record. Um, but like they shouldn't be allowed to speak in the media. I don't think, President Trump and US Congress have to find a way to muzzle all these generals because we can't have this. We cannot have this chaos growing like this. Our nation is gonna be destroyed before 2021. At this rate, with all these generals retired, find a hobby, go fishing for God's sake. Jeez, I mean, to get on TV and bash the commander in chief. That, you're a military person, you shouldn't be doing that, you know? Uh, even though you're retired and you're a civilian now, you had military career and you are like ex-general or whatever, you shouldn't be allowed to speak on TV right now in the midst of a national emergency COVID, um, which I'm saying, Hira Christian Kim is saying, is an advanced biological weapon created by, Japan, uh, by China to destroy our country. That's my theory. I think I'm right. But... Uh, yeah, because I mean, there is a possibility there's a biological weapon. So even if there's a small possibility, I think it is. But if you think if there's even a small possibility, you kind of muzzle all the military. They cannot talk at all to the media at all. One way or another, they can't talk at all. You got to muzzle them. Because right now, I am saying that China will invade us, physically invade us in year 2021 or 2022. Uh, with their military, like maybe 20, 30 million soldiers, they're gonna invade our, our country physically. That's what I'm saying. That's my theory. And I think I have re uh, you know, evidence to support that. So our nation is going through, um, if you assume like nobody's gonna attack us as a nation, you're, you're absolutely wrong. Throughout history, nations get attacked, the outside nations, when there's destabilization. And we've been destabilized by uh, defund police. I mean, right now we're so vulnerable 
like we can be invaded by multiple nations, different nations. My prediction is in 2021 or 2022, we're gonna be invaded by China, probably with, with its alliance, like North Korea, Russia, they're gonna invade us. So, uh, and uh, millions of Americans will die in that invasion. So uh, that's my theory. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. Because I think they're systematically approaching this like a chess game. I, I see China putting pieces in place, Russia putting pieces in place, North Korea putting pieces in place. They're getting ready to attack us. Yeah, I mean, they're playing it like a chess game. So they're, they're moving one piece at a time. But yeah, they're, they're, they're going to attack us. I mean, I'm pretty sure about that, just looking at the steps they're taking. Um, and you know, maybe I'll, I'll devote another episode to my theory, and I'll explain the theory more completely to you. Uh, but um, because this is a possibility, and I think there's no one in the Pentagon who says that this is impossible. I think 100% of the people in the Pentagon say one scenario is that China will invade us. Because this is one possible scenario, we need to muzzle all the military. They can't talk it out to the media. Yeah, I think we need to make that law. Because our country is destabilized as it is. We can't destabilize it further. So uh, you need to do this to stabilize our nation. <clears throat> and the military should be focused on defending America against invading nations like China. Not be confused, you know, and, and disoriented with, uh, you know, with these generals attacking President Trump. That's not right. Like Colin Powell going on TV and calling President Trump a liar. I think Colin Powell should be put into prison personally. If I were in US Congress, I'd try to find a, a way to pass a law to put Colin Powell in prison for calling President Trump a liar. There has, in, we're not in time of peace. We're, we're time of, we're not in time of war technically. <coughs> I'm saying COVID-19 is an advanced biological weapon made by China to attack us and destroy us. But since we haven't stated our objectives against China, technically we're not at war with China. So that's why there's a problem, but still I think we are in a situation of national security crisis that we can, uh, muzzle our military personnel for the sake of national security. We have to take measures to defend our nation. So that's why you need to vote for me for U.S. Congress because these things have to be done. And the Congress, they're too like chaotic now. They, they don't know what they're doing. Both Republican congressmen and Democrat Congress, they're not, 95% of them don't know what's going on. They're like confused. They're like dazed and confused right now. It's a serious problem for America because we need people to be kind of alert, not dazed and confused. But anyway, um, yeah, let's go to the next page. Uh, as I said, there's like thousand people dying per day now. Um, I think that's been the case for a long time, right? So in the last 24 hours, we had 908 people die from COVID-19 and cases are spiking in North Carolina. Cases are spiking in um, Texas. Cases are spiking in California. Cases are spiking in um, Arizona. Cases are spiking in Florida. This is a problem because we have like rate of 6% death, meaning if you have 100 people get it, six are gonna die. That's the constant rate right now. Uh, there's, you know, give or take a few. So more cases American states get, more people are gonna die. It's just, it's a pattern. And right now we're seeing like spike in cases in like dozens of states. And it's a problem because it will result in more death. Uh, I'm predicting that we're gonna have 10,000 people die per day at some point in the summer. And that by August, we're gonna have 1 million Americans dead by COVID. Obviously, I'm hoping it won't happen, but I think it will because pattern is there. Um, yeah. 
So um, yesterday we had 112,895 deaths. Today we have uh, 908 more, and it's at 113,803 deaths. Cases are rising, and we broke the 2 million mark, so it's kind of historic right now. Uh, and so uh, yesterday the total number of confirmed cases was 1. 1 uh, million nine hundred ninety nine thousand five hundred fifty two cases today uh, the cases are at two million twenty two thousand four hundred eighty eight um, so uh, I am showing you uh, top five cases uh, in the world and like, look at this a lot has changed in one week United States of America is number one Brazil is number two now with 802,828 cases. Look at the death rate. You know how many have died since last week? Last week it was below United Kingdom, far below United Kingdom, but they have like 1,000 people dying per day. Now they're at 40,919. 5% of the people are dying, but their cases are skyrocketing. Now they're 802,828 cases, 5% are dying, so they have 40,919. Brazil is just having 1,000 die per day. And it's about to surpass United Kingdom. Look at this. I mean, South America is in serious trouble. Serious trouble. Mexico, it used to have less than like 1,000 cases, you know, a few weeks back. Now it's like, over 12,000 cases in Mexico. Soon you may have 40,000 deaths in Mexico. I mean, if you're Mexican or Mexican-American, you should be worried. It's spreading like wildfire right now in Mexico. And we're only three months in. Think about this, it's just this three months in. We do not have a cure. We do not have a vaccine. This is not seasonal, like it just comes in the winter and goes away in the, in the spring. This is 365 days a year, like hepatitis C virus, or AIDS, like HIV virus, or hepatitis A virus. 365 days a year, it can infect you. If you talk to people, or if you breathe next to a person who's breathing, that's all you need to get infected. Let's say you, someone's standing there and he's just breathing, and you're here breathing and you're not talking at all, you get infected. That's how contagious COVID-19 is. And today, you know, during our clinical session, you know, I was talking um, in the clinical, uh, you know, all of us got together. And um, yeah, I learned today from my clinical that there's a problem with this virus infecting your blood and impacting your blood. So it's not just a respiratory virus. And my clinical instructor said today uh, that there are cases of COVID-19 virus like lying in wait in your intestines. Like it's like in your intestines kind of infecting and stuff like that. And then it starts spreading outward. I mean, this is scary stuff like this COVID-19 uh, unlike the flu, it just like affects your like lungs, right? This can affect your lung, it can affect your bowel system, bowel, like intestines, your stomach and intestine. It could affect your blood. It can kill you in so many different ways. That's what's scary about COVID-19. And that's why I'm saying this is a biological weapon. A natural virus doesn't do all this stuff. It has been genetically modified by China to do what it does, like a weapon, like a cluster bomb. Like, you know, it goes into your body and it's like attacking like different parts of your body. Like it's a, it's a biological cluster bomb. It's genetically been modified. Obviously, because it, this, is, this is not acting like a normal virus. Because there are patterns that normal viruses follow. And so, um, yeah, yeah, so you're in trouble. You're in trouble. I'm predicting that at least 30 million Americans would die by um, year 2022. At least 30 million. 
maybe more. So every one of you watching this show should expect somebody you know to die from COVID-19, like a relative, a friend, a neighbor, you should expect it, your child. I'm calling on Arlington, Alexandria Falls Church of Fairfax County not to open the schools in the fall because you can die. Your children can die from this. Because as I said, uh, I've explained in New York, COVID-19 has mutated and there's a version that attacks children and kills them. And it's called New York virus. So right now, all the children are kind of like locked away in their home, so it's not spreading. But if children are in school, it will spread among each other and children will die. And this is the New York virus. So now that exists, it's, it's, it's around. But most families are keeping their children inside. That's why they're not getting infected. Yeah, so you have a lot of things to look, uh, look forward to in the summer and the fall, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, so scientists still do not know what this thing is. They don't know. They don't know. How are you going to create a vaccine when you don't know what it is? They're looking at it from like micro, microscope and, you know, like all these sophisticated technologies. They still don't know what it is. I mean, for God's sake, they thought this was seasonal flu or like virus. I mean, if you get, get if you could get it that low, wrong at that basic level, I mean, <laughs> think about how much they don't know. Dr. Fauci was saying, yeah, it's going to be a seasonal thing. It's going to be in the winter and it's going to disappear in the summer, come back in the winter. Remember that? I mean, Jesus, for God's sake. I mean, in WHO, every medical expert on TV were saying that two months ago, three months ago, like in March. Where are they now? So this is what I'm saying. Nobody knows what it is, maybe except the Chinese who created it. Because my theory is that it's a weapon created by China. But anyhow, uh, Brazil is like having 1,000 die per day, and now they're over at 40,919. Mexico death is spreading. Uh, Ecuador death is not beginning to spread. Um, geez, for God's sake, Latin America is in trouble. We may have like a million in Latin America die by 2021, but maybe even by Christmas. At this rate, Brazil's, look at the rate that Brazil's going. Mexico is going. We may have like a million in Latin America die before Christmas. But because it's a biological weapon by China, they're making sure that Russia, their ally, is protected, right? So death rate is at 1%. So Russia is 501,800 cases, only 6,522 deaths, only 1% death. Right now, there's no one dying in Korea, there's nobody dying in Asia. Uh, because obviously China is in Asia. They don't have any interest in destroying Asia. They just have interest in destroying America and America's allies like Brazil and, and, um, uh, and England. That brings us to England, United Kingdom. They have 292,860 cases. Their death rate is at 14%. Jeez. I mean, I would hate to be in England because if you're infected, you die. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like 14% of the people die if you're infected. So 41,364 people have died. India, it is alarming because it's growing. It's still at 3%. It's like, that's how much California is. But its death rate was under 1,000. Now look at this, 8,102. Okay? If it starts spread like a wildfire, and as you know, India is an enemy of China, so China may deploy their weapon against India, uh, in which case we could have like, 30 million Indians die, 100 million Indians die. We, we, we cannot even begin to estimate how many Indians will die uh, if it starts spreading like wildfire. And I feel so bad for Indians. Yeah, you guys are, you guys are basically headed to earthly hell with this, you know, with COVID-19. Uh, but let's see, you know, keep watching this show. I'll give you, uh, keep giving you updates. But this is from healthcare perspective or national security, intelligence, uh, weapons warfare perspective. And that's 
why I'm saying you know, this is a weapon that was created by China. But as you know, there's always a spiritual dimension, like when God destroyed uh, Israel by using Babylonians. Uh, Jeremiah said God gave power to Babylonians so that they could destroy Israel completely as a nation. So there's a spiritual dimension. That's the explanation that's given in, in the prophetic books in the Old Testament. So, so we see what the spiritual dimension of destruction of Jerusalem's first temple and the destruction of the country of Israel at that time was. So what is the spiritual dimension of what's going on now in America? And as I've said, COVID-19 is killing 1,000 Americans per day because of homosexuality, because Americans are tolerating homosexuality. That's why God's killing 1,000 Americans per day. So I have said this many times in this show. If you want to survive COVID-19, you must stand publicly against homosexuality. That's what God expects of you. And we see this in Romans chapter 1 and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Um, so if you do not stand against homosexuality, then you should expect to see more death. Not just thousands. I'm predicting that we will have 10,000 deaths per day in America in the summer. Because God obviously hates United States of America, and that's why he's killing 1,000 people per day. God doesn't kill people he loves. He's killing 1,000 people per day in America because God hates America. Why does God hate America? Because America hates God. And that is evident in the fact that Gays are protected. Gay rights are protected. God hates homosexuals. Um, we know God hates homosexuals. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and killed everybody in Sodom and Gomorrah. God hates homosexuals. Uh, not just homosexuality, the sin. Homosexuals, already, homosexuals as people. Because God did not send missionaries to Sodom and Gomorrah. He killed them all. Because God hates homosexuals. So... God is killing 1,000 people per day in America because God hates homosexuals and God is angry at Christians for loving homosexuals because that's forbidden. Loving homosexuals is forbidden in the Bible. How do we know? In the New Testament, Christians are commanded, churches are commanded to excommunicate homosexuals. Anybody who self-declares themselves as homosexuals, you're supposed to block them out of the church you're supposed to use the security or police to remove them from church as soon as they tell you they're homosexual. God doesn't want you to try to convert homosexuals. God doesn't want you to share the gospel with homosexuals. God doesn't want you to love homosexuals. God wants you to excommunicate them, put them out, out of your Christian fellowship, not associate with them. That is, has been the church law for 2,000 years. So if you are trying to love homosexuals, share the gospel with homosexuals, socially associate with homosexuals, then you are violating God's law. Simple as that. I'm going to tell you God's law because we have 1,000 people dying per day. And if you don't know God's law and you, you are breaking God's law, then you may die. I'm trying to save you from COVID-19 death, what I call the wrath of God. Or, what, you know, what Romans chapter 1 calls wrath of God is going to come to you if uh, homosexuality proliferates. So if the Republican National Convention protects homosexual rights, God's wrath is gonna visit Republican National Convention and Republican politicians, Republican families. That's something that you must expect if you're gonna protect gay rights. Because Romans chapter one is a New Testament law and it's very clear what God's gonna do. You read Romans chapter one for yourself. As I said, if Republican National Convention protects gay rights, God's wrath will visit every Republican who attends Republican National Convention. You will experience death by COVID among your family members. Wait and see. Because God hates homosexuals, and if Republican National Convention will defend homosexuals, gay rights, God will punish every Republican who attends the Republican National Convention. Watch and see what wrath of God is like. Yeah, I'm here to save you. So all I say is, 
boycott Republican National Convention if they are going to say they're going to protect gay rights or have gay people speak in the, the, the National Convention. Boycott it because you don't want to experience the wrath of God. I would say all the evangelicals should boycott Republican National Convention and oppose the Republican Party if they're going to fight for gay rights. Because it is a party that God's going to hate. And God's not just going to hate, punish through COVID-19. You don't want to be part of that. Start a new party. I'm independent. Here our Christian Kim is independent candidate for U.S. Congress. I'm not running as a Republican. And I see why God has steered me in this way because there are some Republicans who are trying to push gay rights. And God hates them. Now, you know, God sends people to hell, you know, uh, all homosexuals go to hell as a rule. Uh, and um, so, um, yeah, so, so if Republican Party wants to defend gay rights, you must leave Republican Party. If you stay, God's wrath is going to visit you and your family, and you guys are going to die from COVID, you know, uh, other acts of God, you know, yeah. You must boycott anything that proliferates homosexuality, whether it's a Republican Party or the Democratic Party. If President Trump supports gay rights, you must oppose them with everything you've got. Simple as that. Because God is important. God matters. God's law matters. Now, I've warned you. I said if you stand with President Trump, support him, vote for him, um, if he st uh, stands for gay rights, then you will be punished. Your family will be punished. Your children will be punished by God. I have said it. You've heard it. You have no excuse. You can't say to God, why did three of my children die from COVID-19 in uh, December? Well, you know, you voted for someone who supports gay marriage. If President Trump supports gay marriage, you vote for him, your children are going to die. Write in someone else's name. Write in the name of a politician. You can write my name in, Hera Christian Kim, because you know I oppose gay marriage. You can always write in the ballot. President Trump winning the election is not that important. What's important is that America goes back to God, that America as a nation honors God. Victory for Trump matters nothing if Trump stands for gays. We must oppose him. Trump victory means nothing. You should not vote for Trump if Trump stands with gay rights. You should oppose Trump with everything you've got. And this is someone that I, I like Trump. I voted for 2000, Trump in 2016. I will not vote for Trump in 2020 if he supports gay rights. And I will fight against Trump until the election day if he supports gay rights. I could fight Biden and Trump. Remember, I'm a Calvinist. I like war. If, you know, Biden wants to support gay rights, I'm going to fight him. If Trump wants to support gay rights, I'm going to fight him too. Two front warfare, that's like the best. In the end, God wins. I mean, God's in control of this world. What, do you think we just have two people, Trump and Biden, that's all we have in the world? We can always introduce a third party. I mean, there's no reason to, for us to confine ourselves to Republican Democrat Party. I'm independent. We could start a party. People have, even in US history, we had the Federalist, you know, we have different parties forming. Yeah. You're not a slave to Republican Party. You're not a slave to the Democratic Party. You could form a new party. And that's what I would tell you to do. Because at the end of the day, if you support a political candidate, whether it's Joe Biden or Trump, who supports gay marriage, God's gonna punish your family, God's gonna punish your children. Now, if you don't fear God, do whatever you want. You could experience the wrath of God. But if you fear God, then you will listen to the holy word of God. Do not vote for Trump if he supports gay marriage. Because the wrath of God will visit you. Because Romans chapter 1 is a promise by God to send the wrath of God to you and your family. If you support gay rights. So you must stand against homosexuality. I promise you, I will not vote for President Trump if he supports gay rights. And I will fight against President Trump to ensure that he doesn't win in November, nor in Biden, that neither of them win in November if they support gay marriage. Because I am duty bound as a Christian to attack politicians 
verbally who support gay marriage and gay rights. Because at the end of the day, we have 1,000 people dying every day from COVID-19. This is not fiction. This is happening every day. And I'm telling you from a spiritual angle, this is the wrath of God. Look, there's no one, zero dying in China now. Zero dying in South Korea. How come 1,000 are dying in America? From a spiritual angle, it's the wrath of God. Now, you give God what he wants, he'll give you what you want. Now, if you stand against God's law and support gay rights, if you vote for President Trump, when he public says he publicly says he supports gay rights, then you can expect the wrath of God to visit you and your family. As I said, I promise you, I stand against President Trump if he supports gay rights. Stand against President Trump. Even if you have to go to prison for it, you must stand against gay supporting politicians. Because at the end of the day, God's law trumps all law on earth. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to the fight. If President Trump declares, uh, you know, support for President Trump, uh, gay rights, I will be attacking him every day. I will be attacking him every day. I'm going to make sure he loses all his supporters. That will be my mission in life until November 3rd. You know, I mean, I want to win in the election to help uh, you, you survive COVID-19, to help bring America back to God. But if President Trump supports gay rights, he's the biggest threat to Christian America. And I will, I will fight to separate all the voters, his supporters from President Trump. You make your choice, but I have my duty before God. I will support Jesus and Jesus' is Jesus' word, because I love Jesus. I'm not a slave to Trump. I'm not a slave to Biden. I support Trump only if he follows God's word. And that's how you should be, because you're not a slave of Trump. Yeah, so um, I told you what I'm going to do, and I will do what I said I would do. So I'm kind of looking forward to it because, you know, as you know, I'm a Calvinist. I love war. I love battles. So if President Trump wants to start a fight with uh, Jesus Christ by supporting gay rights, bring it on, man. Bring it on. Yeah, you see Mindy and Mandy, these, these two fishes, they're getting excited at the potential of war. Yeah. I'm getting excited. You know, let's, let's duke it out, President Trump. Let's duke it out. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, you want to support gay rights? You want to oppose Jesus Christ? Let's duke it out. Let's duke it out. Let's see who wins, Jesus or Trump. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I like President Trump, you know, because he did, uh, you know, issue an executive uh, order against transgender in the military, so I respect him for, for that. But that's the past, you know. You can't live in the past. So as I said, if you support gay rights now in the present, I will oppose you. <laughs> look at, look at Harry. You know, he said, looking at me like this. You know, <laughs> be a slave to no man. <laughs> That's what I say. Kneel before no man. <laughs> you know, just before Jesus. Just kneel before Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love Jesus. You know, uh, did I show you my rubber ducky? Look at this Christmas ducky. You know, I'm predicting that you know we're going to have like 10,000 nurses die by Christmas. You know, one million Americans will die by August. But 10,000 nurses will die by uh, Christmas. Uh, and today, like, you know, my clinical instructor was talking about how COVID-19 has affected, you know, um, infected her friends and stuff like that. But can you imagine in the fall, you're going to have, like, influenza A, influenza B. You have strep throat. You have all these other viruses going around. Co you know, and then you have COVID-19. Oh, my gosh. You're gonna, you may have, like, several million die by, you know, like, during Christmas, like, during the, the flu season. Uh, I mean, this is going to be a crazy time. Um, I stocked up on toilet paper. If you come to my apartment, you'll see like, because I'm expecting this to happen. So I'm stocking up. Uh, but I think I need to buy more. Just I, I have to calculate like, how many months I need. You know, because, you know, come September, you're going to have a sharp spike on, of deaths. Everything's going to disappear. 
maybe I need to get some more canned foods, you know. Um, yeah, but anyway, you know, I, I, you gotta prepare for these stuff, you know. You remember when toilet paper was gone and it was confined anywhere that? Why do you think that won't happen again? <laughs> you know, I, if I were you, I would stock up on toilet paper, like, you know, if, if, I mean, if you don't use toilet paper, you don't have to stock up on it, but if you use toilet paper, you can stop, stock up on it, you know, because there's no cure, there's no vaccine, and this is a 365 days a year. Scientists don't know what the heck this thing is. As far as you know, this is going to continue forever. And that's what WHO scientists are saying. This is going to continue forever. I mean, we can have anywhere from 50 million to 1.5 billion people dying from COVID in the next several years. We just don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. But don't be surprised if 1 billion people die. There is no cure. There is no vaccine. There is no law in nature that says 1 billion people cannot be infected and die from COVID. There's no rule like that. You're not going to make that rule because what well, nature does what it wants. It's God's creation does what it wants. So if 1 billion people die from COVID-19 in the next several years, you should not be surprised. As I said, you should not be surprised if one million people die per month during the flu season. You should not be surprised. That could happen. Scientifically, it is more possible than not. If COVID continues to spread, it has its own curve, and then you have like influenza A and influenza B curves. Yeah, you could easily have a million people die per month in the United States alone in the winter time. How do you think 30 million Americans are going to die by year 2022? I'm predicting 30 million Americans will die by year 2022. You have to have some months where millions are dying per month to reach 30 million from now to 2022. We're talking about, what, 24 months. How are you going to have 30 million people die in 24 months if you don't have more than 1 million dying per month in some months? Do you see what I'm saying? You have to... To see this as a global pandemic, you have to see this as a virus that is a killer virus that is spreading. Like if, you, if you're if you sitting in front of me, like the way you're sitting in front of uh, your, t um, your TV or your, your computer screen that you're watching me on, we, both of us may not speak at all. We're just like sitting there breathing. You can get infected just by breathing. And you, you, you don't think that 1 billion people can die from COVID-19? Are you kidding me? Of course you can. I'm not saying that 1 billion people will die, but 1, bil 1 billion people can die from COVID-19. Look, 1,000 people are dying every day, and this is June. Dr. Fauci was saying it was, it was going to go to zero during summer. Like, you know, we won't have any death in the summer. Do you see zero death? 1,000 people are dying per day, summer. How come we have so many deaths? You know, as I said, the cases are increasing in North Carolina, Texas, Arizona, Florida, Alabama. And these cases, several weeks from now, will end in death. You know why Brazil has so many cases? Because they opened, they, they didn't really fully close. So it's spreading like wildfire. You know what happened in New York? That could happen in all 50 states. In every city that could happen, Nashville, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, that could happen. Like in September, every single major city can be like New York. You know that Georgetown University, you know, I'm, um, graduating from uh, Georgetown University with a master's degree uh, in clinical nurse leader, along with uh, my 24 fellow uh, clinical nurse leader cohort members. I love you guys. I was so happy to see my cohort members, Kelsey, Billy, and Maggie, and uh, Grant, and our clinical instructor today. And also like earlier in the day, uh, you know, we had a bigger class. <laughs> I was like, I love you guys, you know? I mean, we're bound. You know, some of us will die before Christmas. Let's admit it. As I said, 20% um, of all the new nurse graduates will die by, um, by, by uh, Christmas, I'm predicting. So 
my cohort, we have 25 people. Five of us will die, minimum five of us will die by Christmas. Just think about this. We're going to influenza A, influenza B, strep throat, all kinds of other seasonal viruses that are going to be cold, common cold. And then we have COVID-19 combining. We can have a million Americans die per month starting like September. Um, 10,000 nurses minimum would die. I'm predicting that minimum 20% of class of 2020 nurses would die. Uh, so I'm expecting five people in my cohort to die. The reason I'm, I'm expecting it, because if you feel like none of us will die, you could be traumatized, you know? You could like lose your mind. So looking at the evidence and what the potential could be, you gotta kind of calculate, oh, at this rate, there's high likelihood that 20% of the new graduates could die because they're inexperienced. So I already have picked out five people from my court who I think will die by Christmas. You know, because they've shared with the rest of the core, like they the preconditions, like they have asthma or they have like peanut allergy. Like these people are gonna die first, obviously. Um, you know, or diabetes or whatever. You know, you're gonna die first. Just because, you know, wait until September. You'll see what I mean. I mean, it's hard to explain when you're not seeing with your own eyes, right? Um, Georgetown University is anticipating this. So Georgetown Law School said, for fall semester 2020, if you don't want to come to campus because of COVID-19, you don't have to. So let's say you got accepted to Georgetown Law School from California, you don't even have to come to Georgetown. You could just do whole semester, fall semester from California in your home because they're going to make that option available to you. And I encourage you to take it because a lot of people are going to die. The safest place for you to be is in your home near your mom and dad, because your mom and dad may die. Your wife may die, your children may die. So um, yeah, I would say fall semester, don't go anywhere, stay where you are. If your college is not gonna be like Georgetown and say you can do remote learning, you know, 100% of the class is remote, just take a leave of absence for one semester or one year, um, because it's not worth it. Because you know you're gonna come to Georgetown, and then COVID-19 is gonna start spreading, and then school is gonna close down. What happened in March will probably start happening in either September or October, you know, because there's gonna be too many deaths, and people are not gonna even fly at that time, kind of like what happened in March. It may be far worse, because I'm, I'm predicting the possibility of one million people dying per month. Uh, because, you know, from now to August, I'm predicting one million people will die. But like September, October, November, December, you can have 1 million people die per month. Uh, so that's why I'm saying Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and Fairfax County Public Schools should close right now. Even Georgetown is saying, if you don't want to come to campus, don't come. And I hear a Christian came running for independent candidate, uh, running as an independent candidate for US Congress, telling you, don't come. If you want to start law school, just do it remotely from your, wherever you are. I mean, you can, you can start your program, but don't come to campus and risk your life, risk the life of your loved ones, because you know it's going to get far worse in the fall. I mean, there isn't one scientist in the world who's saying it's going to get better in the fall. Not one scientist. Every scientist are saying it's going to be far worse in the fall. Now, there's difference between the predictions. Some are saying a lot of people are going to die. Some are saying, well, you know, not as many people are going to die, you know, but they, all the people are going to die. It's just different number. So yeah, stay where you are. I mean, if you think, you know, getting one semester of law degree is worth death, be my guest, just come and die. You know, I mean, geez, I mean, I mean, you know, if one million people are going to die, you could be one of these one million, right? I mean, there's gonna, they're gonna come from somewhere. People who are gonna survive are the ones who are like staying at home and protecting themselves. Yeah, <laughs> I'm afraid how many people are gonna die from the Republican convention. You may have like thousands of people from Republican convention dying. 
I mean, President Trump said, hey, you, you're at own, your own risk. If you come to convention and you, you get COVID and die, that's your risk. You know, I'm like hoping like President Trump won't get COVID and die. You know, that's my biggest worry. You know, Joe Biden, I don't worry too much about because he supports abortion, supports gay marriage. So like, I mean, I'm like, God, just give him COVID and take him away. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sorry, President Biden. Sorry, Vice President Biden, but that's how I honestly feel. Because, you know, you support killing little babies. I think it would be poetic justice if you get COVID-19 and die. You may, you may be like, oh, what a horrible, horrible thing to say. Hey, but you support killing little babies. I, I mean, geez, what's more horrible than that? I mean, I, what I say is like health in comparison. Oh, you support killing babies. I'm just saying, you know, you're old. You may get COVID. You may die. I mean, geez, I mean. I think every American is like considered a possibility. So uh, yeah, but anyhow, anywho, um, yeah. So you're looking at a horrible summer and horrible fall, but why should you be joyful? Because Jesus lives. Jesus is alive. Oh, praise the Lord Jesus. <laughs> you know, in fact, you know, God sending wrath to America to kill 1,000 people per day, in fulfillment of the promise that he made in Romans chapter one, doesn't that encourage you at one level? Because now you know God exists, right? You know, if you have these gay marriage, pride marches, and nobody's dying, you question the existence of God, wouldn't you? Because God hates homosexuals. He killed everybody in Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says, obviously, if people are proliferating homosexuality and nothing happens and this God doesn't exist. That this Genesis, all them go right, it's all fiction. But now that like 1,000 people are dying per day in America, you're like, hey, maybe it's not fiction. Maybe it happened. Do you see what I mean? The greatest evidence for the existence of God is the fact that 1,000 people are dying per day in America as America has pride marches, gay rights uh, laws, gay marriage laws. So you're like, oh man, maybe God does exist. Romans 1, promised wrath of God. Look, 1,000 people are dying per day, right? This is more of a witness than Franklin Graham preaching. More people are going to come to know Jesus because of the fact 1,000 people are dying per day than Franklin Graham preaching, that God loves you. Because you know as a rational being that this is strange that 1,000 1, people are dying per day in America when nobody's dying in China, right? You're a rational being, so you're thinking. And you're reading Romans chapter 1, and it says God promises wrath for homosexuality, and you're like, wow, maybe this God who promises wrath in Romans chapter 1 exists. You see, this is a greater witness for Jesus than Franklin Graham, John MacArthur, John Piper, Joe Austin preaching combined. No, yeah, I mean, this is the greatest proof of the existence of God, right? Because some people are like, how could a loving God allow this to happen? What are you talking about? Romans chapter 1 promises this God will do this. And he's not so loving. I mean, he's killing 1,000 people. You're saying he's loving, but I mean, show me the proof. Show me the proof that God is loving. I mean, I believe God is loving, but also God is vengeful. It's just, you know, he's, he has both sides to him. He's not just one. He has both sides. You know, like, if you're married to your woman whom you love, and you know she has good sides and bad sides. You know, it's just, you know, you know, she's not just one thing. God's like that too. God loves, but also God hates. God saves, but also God kills, you know. And, and that's why, you know, um, uh, is it in Proverbs or Ecclesiastes? They said there's time to make peace, there's time to make war, there's time to love, there's time to hate. In Romans, God said, Jacob, I've loved, Esau, I've hated. Right? So, you know, you, you see all this, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, and so um, Adam and Eve is where a marriage happened. And so we call it the creation mandate that one man be married to one woman. And um, obviously in Christianity, there's this idea that Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride, right? Uh, showing that uh, this 
uh, holy matrimony is a symbol that show or a sacrament that shows us um, the ultimate spiritual reality. And so you see the the priest there uh, conducting the um, uh, sacrament of holy matrimony there, and you see next to that picture of Jesus, because Jesus is present in the marriage, holy matrimony, and his sacrament where uh, grace of God is imparted. Now, yes, it's summertime, and you know what that means. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. So let's talk about God's perspective. You know, I, you know, you're always talking about your ideas and your perspective. Let's talk about God's perspective. What's God thinking? What does God want? What's in it for God, right? So let's talk about God. God wants his law kept, right? God wants you to keep his law. And that's a very important thing. God wants you to keep his law, right? God gave his law through Moses had it codified and written down in the Bible. And now you have this Bible where you can read the Bible. Now, in the Bible, God promises to bless those who keep his law and to punish, which includes also killing, people who break his law, whether you are Christian or non-Christian, believer or non-believer. If you do not follow God's law, God will punish you. If you follow God's law, God will bless you. It's a very simple formula. You know, it's not that complicated. Now, so let's think about how many ways God can punish America in summer 2020. Yes, we have COVID. It's killing 1,000 people per day. And that's going to continue. It may come to 10,000 people a day. But there's no law that says there can't be any other acts of God. That acts of God is only just COVID. No. So let's talk about how many different types of acts of God could be there in summer 2020 for you if you allow gay pride marches to take place in your towns, your cities, your states. What can you expect from God? Or are you curious? If you want to support gay rights, you, don't you want to know what God may do to you for supporting gay rights? I mean, I would want to know if I were you, right? I mean, would you want to be just like blindsided? This is why I created this show, COVID-19 Update by Iraq. So you can live, you can survive, you can be saved. I mean, if you know what kind of things you do will cause death for yourself, through act of God, when you try to avoid those things, that will bring the wrath of God down upon you, your family, and your children. This is where here our Christian king comes in. <coughs> here our Christian Kim comes in to show you what you can expect if you participate in gay pride marches or tolerate gay pride marches, support gay rights in any shape or form or gay marriage laws in any shape or form, Hero Christian Kim is here to tell you what kind of things you could expect from God. That way you're not surprised when it happens. I mean, you may not have much time before your death by these acts of God, but at least you're not surprised, right? If you participate in gay pride marches or allow them to take place in your city, then God's wrath will visit you and your children. That's just a biblical principle. Do you want to know the truth or do you want me to lie to you? Do you want me to lie to you? If you don't want me to lie to you, then I'm going to tell you the truth. I mean, if you want me to lie to you, just don't watch this show because I'm not going to lie to you. Because my, my belief is this. If you're gonna die from COVID-19, you need to know. And then you could choose. Like if you wanna open up, open up, but at least know that you are gonna die, maybe from COVID-19. That there's that chance there, that your chance for death goes up if you open up. And it doesn't mean you will definitely die, but your chance will go up. You need to know that, right? Someone has to tell you the truth, and I'm going to tell you the truth. 
You remember that time when CDC and WHO were saying, don't wear a mask? Remember that? What did Hirak say? Hirak Christian Kim said, wear a mask to protect your life. Because I care about you. I want you to live. So I'm going to discuss other acts of God that can happen in this summer so you can start preparing. You need to prepare, right? Because if you don't have 50 righteous people, you don't know what's going to happen to your state, your city. So number one, what do we always, always, always hear about every summer without fail? California wildfires. Yes, they're coming. Every summer you have California wildfires that burn houses, just burn land. It's getting closer and closer to cities. Who knows, maybe this is the year that like, you know, half the city of Los Angeles burns down by you know, wildfires. Who knows? We don't know. It could happen. Um, but California wire, wildfires are coming. Uh, and, you know, um, generally they, you know, you see a lot of them like June, July, August, right? Especially July and August. So California has something to look forward to. And we, call, we talk about this as acts of God because it's a natural thing, right? Houston floods, they're famous, you know, um, yeah, Houston floods. So if you're living in Houston, you should probably prepare for floods this summer, you know? I mean, yeah, I mean, flooding can be at different degrees, but it could really be bad, like half the city can be underwater. So if you're in Houston, you should prepare for Houston floods. If you're in Oklahoma, I mean, you know, it's known for tornadoes. So, I mean, the devastation, you know, like this year even, there were a lot of tornadoes that devastated. So that's something that you could prepare for, obviously, right? How about Florida? I think uh, Republican National Convention is going to be Jacksonville, Florida, right? I, I like Florida because, you know, you have a lot of good, good Christians there. But you still need to prepare for a hurricane. Because look at this hurricane season in Florida. 40% of all hurricanes that make a landfall in America, they hit Florida. Of course, it doesn't do the devastation that it does in some areas, right? Like uh, Hurricane Sandy is devastating New York and New Jersey. Went all the way up there, you know? Or Hurricane Katrina it completely destroyed uh, New Orleans. So you have these hurricanes that really damage America. And Florida hasn't been damaged that much. Interestingly enough, but you know, now we know 2020 may be different. Every year it's just like, you know, it's a question mark, right? Uh, and so uh, hurricane, you know, um, season is coming. So, and obviously any of these things could happen to anyone, like Oklahoma could have our fires, Houston can have fires, Florida can have fires, right? California can have floods. Uh, Oklahoma can have floods, Florida can have floods. Hurricane can hit California, hurricanes can hit Houston, hurricanes can hit Oklahoma. I mean, anything is possible. I mean, hurricane went all the way up to New Jersey and New York, Hurricane Sandy and hit, hit there, right? Anything can happen. So that is to say summer 2020, next three months, we do not know what's gonna happen. We're in June, June, July, August. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how many Americans are going to die. We know that we have currently 1,000 Americans dying per day. So that's something that is kind of consistent. But if California fires get too bad, we may have thousands die per day from those. If Houston floods get too bad, we could have thousands per day dying from those. If Oklahoma tornadoes become really bad, you know, I mean, theoretically you could have I mean, you have you know, a few people dying, but you could theoretically have like thousands die too. Florida hurricanes, uh, yeah, you could have more than thousands die, you know? So we just don't know what's gonna happen in summer 2020. So fear of God is beginning of wisdom. That's all I could tell you. At the end of God, these are acts of God, controlled by God. As you know, God hates homosexuals because Romans chapter one says so. Um, Genesis says so, Deuteronomy, uh, uh, Leviticus says so. So follow the law. If somebody tells you they're homosexual, do not let them into your church. Do not share the gospel with them. Do not love them because that's forbidden in God's law. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to lie to you, okay? 
It may not be the popular position to take, but I believe that you deserve to know the truth to avoid all these acts of God. Do you want to live or do you want to die? Now, I'm going to tell you God's position as recorded in the Bible. You can do what you want. You're a free agent. You're not a slave. You can do whatever you want, but I'm telling you what God expects from you from the Bible. And God promises wrath of God or acts of God on you and your family and your children if you violate God's law. So the freedom is yours. You do what you want. I'm telling you, homosexuality is far more evil than first degree murder in the Bible. It's far more evil than anything you can do in the Ten Commandments. Romans chapter one is very clear on that point. It's an unnatural evil. According to Romans chapter one, I'm just quoting them. Now, if you want to avoid God's wrath upon you and your family and your children, do not love homosexuals. Do not share the gospel with homosexuals. Do not socially associate with homosexuals like as friends. Then you will be protected from God's wrath. And publicly oppose homosexuality, you must. Now, I am telling you how you can survive the wrath of God. Keep it or leave it, that's your decision. As I said, God hates homosexuals so much. I will oppose President Trump from the moment he declares support of gay rights until the election day. And make sure people don't vote for him. That's how much God hates homosexuals. I am duty bound as someone who loves Jesus to do this if President Trump decides to declare war on the Bible by supporting gay people, then this is necessary. It's a duty for every Christian, not just for me, but every one of you out there who says you love Jesus. You must do this. Because it's God's law. This is God wanting you to prove that you love Jesus. President Trump must prove that he loves Jesus too. He must stand against homosexuality. He must stand against gay marriage. He must stand against gay rights. Because the Bible says homosexuality is unnatural. It's evil. It's a crime. So homosexuality, gay rights is not protected under the First Amendment according to the law of God. Because it's a crime. Just like first degree murder is not protected under the First Amendment. Amendment, homosexuality, gay rights, gay marriage, not protected in the First Amendment. Now you know. Aren't you glad you're watching this show? I mean, if you hadn't seen this show, you may be breaking God's law by accident and experiencing wrath of God. But now that you've watched this show, you're not going to accidentally break God's law. If you break God's law, you'll be intentional. Because I told you what God's law is. But, you know, it's better to know, right? That way you know what you can expect from God if you break his law intentionally. That includes you, President Trump. Yeah. And obviously Lindsey Graham and Ted Cruz and Mark Rubio, all of you and your families, you have to face God. You know, God's not going to let you go just because you're a senator. Yeah. I mean, you know, all of us, when we stand before God, we are standing before the judgment of God. That is why fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, Senator Cruz. Fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, Senator Rubio. Fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, uh, Senator Graham. Fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, Senator Paul. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, I fear God. I love God, but I fear God. Because God's wrath is a scary thing. It is a scary thing. And a fear of the Lord is beginning wisdom. If you do not fear God, uh, yeah. I don't know what to say to you, you know. Because God himself wants to be feared. He said he wants us to fear him. And he wants us to love him, but he also wants us to fear him. 
That's why he said fear of God is beginning with wisdom. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm happy to help you survive COVID-19. I'm happy to help you survive California wildfires or Houston floods or Oklahoma flor or tornadoes and Florida uh, hurricanes. Um, yeah, I created this show to save your lives. So I'm going to give you the truth. You can reject it and suffer the consequences from God. That's your freedom. But I'm here to save your life, so I'm just going to give you the truth. You do what you want. You know, you're a free agent. Uh, but remember, God's a free agent too, and he has promised to do certain things, and the God always keeps his promises. So let's not forget that. Yeah. Anyway, vote for me on November 3rd, 2020 for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th District, so I could go to uh, Congress and bring America back to God. As you know, that's my platform. Bring America back to God, because God is worth it. Jesus is worth it. That's why. Yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to join this show. You know, don't you feel like you've learned a lot in this show? I mean, you were entertained. You you received a lot of information you needed. You, uh, you, you have now are thinking about issues that you need to think about, you know, and you can become a hero of your family by saving them from California wildflowers, Houston floods, Oklahoma tornadoes, or hur Florida hurricane. You can be that hero by fearing God, and which is beginning of wisdom. So um, yeah, this is Daily Show. As you know, uh, I filed a lawsuit against the Governor of Northam and uh, uh, Virginia Board of Elections. So I am here till November 3rd to say, what am I gonna say? No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Yeah, God wants his justice just like you want your justice. Yeah. God wants his justice too. Um, yeah, so um, I hope that you will be well and that your family will be well as well. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, so uh, have a good night. Bye.